Hello everyone, I hope you're all doing well. In today's lecture, we're going to go over chapter 2, sources of information, why research is best, and how to find it. So we're going to continue on that pathway of starting to think about critical thinking and where we're getting our information from and evaluating where that information came from and what we can do with it. Um, and again, another shorter chapter. So for our overview, we're going to talk about three sources of evidence for people's beliefs, sources other than research. So we can talk about experience, intuition, and authority. And then we want to compare how each of those sources is different from and not as good as using empirical research. The idea here being that that critical thinking scientific method is going to be better than um, relying on, say, experience or intuition or authority to try and draw your own conclusions. And then at the end, we're going to talk just a little bit about finding and reading research. So if research is so great, how do you find it and what do you do with it once you have it? So those are our topics for this video. And so we're going to start right off the bat with experience. So research versus personal experience. And when we're talking about experience, this might be your own personal experience. Maybe it's an experience from a friend or family member. Um, and humans tend to put a lot of weight into things that they've heard from people they trust or things that they themselves have experienced. So maybe you've heard someone say, oh, well, I've been using tanning beds for years and I don't have skin cancer. Um, and that's an anecdotal story of a single person who hasn't um, encountered the problem of skin cancer being linked to tanning beds. Um, but that doesn't mean that we should discredit all of the research that links prolonged exposure to UV with developing skin cancer. Um, and so the reason why this, per or one of the main reasons why this personal experience isn't as useful as research is that experience has no comparison group. Um, and so a comparison group is basically when you're looking at what happens when this situation happens. Um, so you're comparing what would occur with the thing you're looking at. So people who do use tanning beds. Um, and how do you compare that to what happens without the thing that interests you? What are we comparing it to? So what about people who don't use tanning beds? Um, and talking about comparing with and without a certain situation should start reminding you about a scientific experiment where we can compare between two different situations and make broader and more useful conclusions based on that broader base of information. So if we want to talk about a example of a situation where having a comparison group would have been useful, we can go back in history. And back in the 1700s, the practice of bloodletting, that is, um, say, cutting someone so that they could get rid of excess blood, was actually a pretty widespread medical practice. Doctors would cut the sick so that they could get rid of some of their blood, drain impurities, um, and so on and so forth. And so this practice, um, from our modern viewpoint, is pretty barbaric. If we think of someone who's ill, who is then going through the added trauma of losing a volume of blood and having to go through the extra effort of creating new blood cells, along with the fact that our blood contains our white blood cells that are helping us fight off any kind of disease or infection, this practice is really not a great way to go. But at the time, bloodletting was rather common, and one of the reasons why it stuck around is because doctors who were um, employing bloodletting weren't using good scientific practices, they weren't using a comparison group. And so what I mean by that is, if a doctor practiced bloodletting, they would use it on all of their patients. So if that was their practice, they would cut all of their patients and they observed that some would improve and some would die. And they concluded that the ones that improved 
did so because of the bloodletting. That treatment um, helped those patients recover and get better faster. And they concluded that the ones that died, died because they were so sick that they would have died anyways. They concluded that they were so sick that bloodletting couldn't have helped, and so um, the improvements were because of their treatment and the deaths were just because they were really sick. And so we can already see some flaws in their reasoning here. Um, and if we wanted to evaluate the effectiveness of bloodletting, if we wanted to do a um, sort of non-biased evaluation of this, we could system systematically compare bloodletting to other forms of medical treatment. Or in the case of our example, what if we looked at no treatment? Is bloodletting better or equivalent to or worse than um, doing nothing? And so we're going to walk through just a really quick example that's going to show um, some of the ways that we can start looking at numbers just very quickly. We'll, in this course, get into a lot more detail on uh, statistics and that sort of thing. But for now, we're just going to look at a basic percentage. We're going to look at um, a way of representing an entire sample so that we can do a quick comparison between groups. So nothing statistical yet, just uh, descriptive data here. And so here we're going to look at three different versions of this table. And we're going to talk about how changing a variable um, can influence your interpretation of the data overall. And so for this table, we're looking at um, patients who recovered, so people who got better and lived, versus patients who died. So recovery or death, those are our two options. And we're going to look at two groups. We will compare between two groups. So we have our bleeding group. So these are the people who went through bloodletting. And we have the not bled group, so people who didn't go through bloodletting. And so if we want to look at this chart here, this number here is the number of patients who recovered who had been bled. And then the patients who died who had been bled and um, recovered and died for those who had not been bled. And so if we want to compare um, how many people recovered having been bled or not bled, we can't just compare these numbers directly. And the reason why is because our groups are two different sizes. So for our bled group, people who went through bloodletting, we had a hundred people in that category. Um, whereas for the people who were not bled, we only had 50 people total here. So it's not fair to compare our um, total number, what we should do is take into account the size of the groups overall. So we can look at it here divided by the total number of patients. So 20 out of 100 or 10 out of 50. And that gives us a percentage. You could also represent it as a ratio. But this tells us that 20% of patients recovered regardless of the condition they were in. So 20% of people recovered whether they were bled or not bled. Um, and this is all theoretical data. This isn't something that was actually observed at the time. We're just using this to illustrate some of these numbers. So what happens if we decrease one of our values? So here, we're changing this one uh, cell in our table. And this is, we're going to decrease the number of patients who died in the not bled condition. So originally, 40 people who hadn't been bled were reported as having died. But in this example here, we're saying only one of them who was not bled actually died. And so this adjusts our total number of patients. So instead of there being 50 people in this group, we now have 11. And so from our bled group, nothing changed. 20% of people still recovered if they went through bloodletting. But changing this one cell turned our 20% recovery rate into a 91% recovery rate. So on the last slide, and here with table 2.1, we said that there was no difference between people who were bled versus not bled. But here, we're seeing a big difference. And we would want to say that the group that was not bled 
had a much higher recovery rate than those who were bled. Um, and again, like I said, we're not doing statistics here. We can't say that there is a significant difference in the number of people who recovered in the groups, but we can say that our percentage is higher. And we'll get into talking about statistical significance and what we can and can't say as the course goes on. Um, and so this is if one value decreases, that's what happens. Um, what if we went the other way? What if we increased that number? So here, instead of having just one person in the not bled group who died, or 10, or whatever, if we bump that number all the way up to 490, we end up saying that the number of patients who recovered in this not bled group is only 10 out of 500 total patients. And that drops our percentage recovered for that group down to 2%. And so in this case, what we would say is that the bled group actually had that higher recovery percentage. So um, bloodletting in this situation would have been the better course of treatment. Um, and that's how just changing one simple number can have uh, very vast differences on the results that we're seeing in the end. And so that's why we really want to see a comparison group. And when you're looking at scientific research, you're almost always going to see a comparison. People who have a condition versus don't have a condition. People who got a treatment versus didn't get a treatment. Or even people who got treatment A versus people who got treatment B. We want to compare two different things. We don't want to just look at a single case. Another thing that we should consider is the fact that individual experience is confounded. And what we mean by having a confound is that something else is going on. We are confused as to the source of what's happening. So in the real world, there are lots of different explanations for an outcome. Um, if the one person that you talk to who's been using tanning beds all their life doesn't have skin cancer, well, is that because of the tanning beds or is there something else in their life that's insulating them from getting skin cancer? Maybe while using tanning beds, they're still using sunscreen. Or maybe they are genetically predisposed not to get cancer. Um, there's so many unknown variables or confounds that can confuse the situation. So when we're looking at things out in the real world, there are lots of other explanations that we have to consider before accepting that information at face value. Um, and of course, that's really hard to do in the real world where you can't really control for any of those extra variables. And that's why we bring it back to research being better because we have the ability to try and control and manipulate some of those extra variables so that we're more certain about what's going on. And that brings us to the next slide. So we can set up as scientists a systematic comparison and we can control those potential confounds. So if we wanted to look at skin cancer and tanning bed use, maybe we could have people who use tanning beds a lot versus a little, and we can make sure that they all wear sunscreen or none of them wear sunscreen, or that um, one group wears sunscreen and the other doesn't. So we can start controlling and manipulating some of those extra variables. Um, and by doing this, by setting up this system, scientists can look at everything from the outside. So they have an external view um, and not personally invested view of the situation. Whereas personal experience, if you're thinking about something that you yourself have gone through or that your family member has gone through, you're viewing a situation from the inside. And again, it gets a little bit messy when you can't take that step back and start controlling for variables. To illustrate how research can control for confounds, I want to use an example. And so we're going to use a 2002 study conducted by Bushman where they were investigating the effects of catharsis on aggression. 
So catharsis is a feeling of relief or venting emotion, somewhere where you can feel better after uh, sort of acting out on your emotions. And so in this study, they wanted to look at the idea that um, if you could express your anger, if you could direct your anger in a situation, that you should feel better and then be less angry after you have vented. And so for this setup, um, they were looking at a bunch of undergraduate, res or undergraduate participants, and the researchers wanted to make these participants angry. So they didn't want to just look at, say, an anecdotal experience where somebody was angry and they played a violent video game and then they felt better. So here they wanted to actually manipulate and control the situation. So all of the undergraduates in their study were made to feel angry. They controlled that situation and they did this by getting the research or the undergraduates to write an essay and they had someone critique those essays. And the person doing the critiquing, his name was Steve, and he was what's called a confederate, which means that he wasn't just any random person who was helping give feedback on essays, he was part of the experiment. And the researchers told Steve to say things about the essays to make people angry. So he would tell them that it was the worst essay that they've ever read. He would make rude comments, tell them they were terrible writers, and so on and so forth. And so the outcome of that is everyone was angry at Steve. So then the researchers assigned these undergraduates to one of three conditions. And we can actually see these conditions at the bottom here. So group one was assigned to sit quietly. So they were made angry and then they were told to go sit in a room by themselves and they could stew in their anger. The second group is one of our control groups. And this group was, going, was told to punch a punching bag for two minutes and that using this punching bag was a form of exercise. The third group was told to go punch a punching bag but they were specifically told that they should imagine Steve's face on that bag while they were punching it. So this is the group that should be experiencing catharsis, where they're venting their rage towards this punching bag of Steve. Um, and so then the researchers could compare not only how did groups perform if they didn't do anything, versus if they had this cathartic experience of punching what they imagined to be Steve's face, but we also looked at what could have been a confounding variable. Um, if we think about it, the group that sat quietly just sat still. They didn't move very much. But the group that was using a punching bag was doing exercise. So they had two things different from the sitting quietly group. They were exercising and they were imagining taking th things out on Steve. So to tease apart whether it was the act of punching a punching bag or if imagining Steve's face on that punching bag had some sort of effect, that's why there's this second group here where there's people punching a punching bag, but it has nothing to do with venting your anger. And so we can look very briefly at the results here um, so we have our three groups, which we just walked through, and on this axis here, we're just looking at subsequent aggression. So how angry were these students after the experiment? Um, and these are presented as uh, z-scores. Again, we'll get into the specifics of that throughout this course. All we care about is this zero line is going to be sort of the average feeling of aggression for people in the group. Um, and people who were sitting quietly were actually less aggressive than others. Um, people who punched a punching bag were neutrally aggressive. And the interesting part here is that the people who punched a punching bag while imagining Steve's face on it, they were more aggressive after the fact. Um, and so we can talk about this in terms of catharsis theory, and this is one of numerous studies that's given us evidence suggesting that catharsis isn't really a thing. 
So people who act on those violent feelings who get out that aggression end up actually feeling more aggressive in the long term. Um, but that's sort of beside the point here. What we're caring about is the fact that this was a really well set up experiment, um, and we'll touch back on this again later on in the course, but it gives us three different groups that we can compare between, and by having those different groups set up in a really nice way, we can compare if it's imagining Steve's face, if it's punching a punching bag, or what that's driving the differences between these groups. Um, so controlling these confounds gives us a much clearer idea of what's going on with our data. And so moving on from that, we can talk about our next point, which is that we should consider the fact that research is probabilistic. So this is where a single person's uh, experience with something differs dramatically from the research. So when we say that research is probabilistic, we're saying that the findings of this research are not expected to explain absolutely everything all the time. So if you see a study that says that there's a link between uh, UV exposure and skin cancer, that research isn't saying that absolutely everyone who's exposed to UV rays is going to develop skin cancer. It's just saying that by having more exposure to UV, you're at a higher risk for getting skin cancer. Um, and so that kind of ties back to the fact that research is looking at more than just one person. We have a larger sample size than just one. We're looking at a larger group and we're gonna compare between groups. Whereas individual experience is, you're just looking at one person's experience. So you could be the one person um, who doesn't have skin cancer despite lots of UV exposure. You could also be one person who has very little UV exposure, but still get skin cancer. So research isn't supposed to explain absolutely every case that we can see. It's just giving us some probability. It's giving us some chances um, and trying to explain the big picture. So uh, individual experience can give you what one person has experienced, but it's not going to allow you to extrapolate or expand what you're looking at to other people. Whereas this probabilistic nature of research gives you an ability to say, well, the probability or the chances are the more you're exposed to UV, the more likely you are to get skin cancer. Nothing concrete. Um, and it's good to know those limitations when you're looking at your sources of data. So from our individual experiences, we're going to move into intuition, that gut feeling that people have. Um, and again, people tend to rely very heavily on our instinct, our intuition and our gut. But again, the problem is that intuition is biased. We run into an issue where it's pretty easy to sway someone with a good story. If somebody can tell you something and the logic behind it seems to make sense and it feels like it fits, then you might accept that conclusion just because it sounds right. Um, and this is why intuition and gut feeling isn't great. Um, you can think about things like um, common sayings, uh, birds of a feather flock together, so people who are like-minded will become friends. But you also tend to agree with the statement that opposites attract, which is telling us the exact opposite of what we had just said. So there are some contradictions in our intuition, and unless we're forced to face the flaws in our intuition, we can operate on some pretty biased or um, non-scientific information. Another way that we're biased in our intuition is that it's pretty easy to per persuade people um, to think about things that easily come to mind. Um, and this is called the availability heuristic. Um, so things that come to mind easily are more available in our memory and can bias our thinking. So if you are driving home 
and you have to pass through 15 different stoplights to get home. But the last three stoplights are red, and so you hit the red light and you have to wait. And then you hit the next red light and you have to wait, and then you hit the final light and it turns red and you have to wait again. Maybe you get home and you vent to your partner and you say, oh my gosh, every single light, the whole drive home was red. And that isn't true. There were 12 lights that you passed through uneventfully that were green, but because the last three were recent, fresh in your mind, and really aggravating, you think of those a lot more easily, and you might make the incorrect conclusion that you had a really rough drive home and you hit more red lights than you should have. Um, another example of this is that people tend to think that shark attacks are really common, but in fact they're actually pretty rare. Being killed by a shark is less, than, er, is less likely than just dying of natural causes in a bathtub. But visually and in our minds, a shark attack is a lot more vivid and easy to imagine, and it's something that will be memorable and stick in your mind, so it's going to be something that comes to mind more often, and so you might think that more people die in shark attacks because you hear about shark attacks all the time, but you never really think about people just dying from natural causes in a bathtub. Um, so we are easily influenced by some of the quirks of how our memories work and the things that we remember. And kind of the opposite side of that, we have a bias where we sometimes fail to think about things that we can't see. So if we're spending more time focused on the things that are easy to remember, and we don't spare a thought to think about things that don't pop into mind, you can have a pretty big problem in the conclusions that you're making. And so this failure to think about something you can't see is called the present slash present bias. So you notice things that are there and you acknowledge that things that are uh, observable are seen, but you don't look beyond that. We tend not to look past something that we've observed. Um, it's hard to think of an example for this one, but um, the textbook uses the idea that blondes have more fun. So if that's a common saying, and because that's something that we uh, now have in our common vernacular, and it's something that we think about, if you see someone who's having fun and they're blonde, then you go, oh yes, that matches the saying. But you're not really going out of your way to look for people who are blonde who maybe aren't having fun. You're only noticing the people who are actively enjoying themselves and who are also blonde. Again, biases in focusing on what you're looking for and not really making the effort to see things other than that. And the next thing is we tend to focus on evidence that we like best. So people have a tendency to only look for information that agree with what we already believe. And this can also be called a confirmation bias. And so in my previous example of blondes have more fun, if you accept that saying as true, then you might only look at blonde people who are having fun and take that as support. And you might dismiss the fact that there is somebody else in the group having fun who doesn't have blonde hair um, because that doesn't line up with what you expect or what you already think. So we can cherry pick information um, that's going to support what we already believe and we can maybe downplay some of the evidence that doesn't really support what we think. Um, and then our last point, the last flaw of being human, is that we're biased about being biased. So despite the fact that I've told you about all of these ways that humans and our thinking can be flawed, people's reaction to this sort of information is, well, yes, most people are biased, but not me. People usually think that they are the exception to the rule and everyone else is the biased one. 
Um, so we could say that we have a bias blind spot. We're sort of um, ignoring our own biases because we couldn't be that silly. We couldn't have those biases. Um, and so an example here is there have been lots of studies conducted where you can survey people um, and ask them how biased they think they themselves are and how biased the general population is. And almost always, the average person taking this survey says that others are more biased than themselves, but they are not biased. Um, and so if everyone thinks that they're the only person that isn't biased and everyone else is biased, there's something not quite right there. So we run into this issue where people don't really acknowledge the fact that everyone has flaws in how they think. Um, and this kind of puts us into a really depressing situation where we're saying, well, if just by being human we have problems with bias and our thinking and logic is flawed, then what can we do? And that's where we bring it back to research again and scientific reasoning, which helps us acknowledge and avoid some of these biases just by using the structure of how we set up our research. And so we have this issue, so we're gonna make mistakes if we base our reasoning on intuition rather than science, because all of those biases can exist. But if we start using things like comparison groups and using systemic ways of approaching the data where we can't let our biases influence the outcome, um, that allows us to have a little bit better of a time. Our scientific reasoning can sort of rescue us from some of these biases. And so our last section of um, other sources of information is trusting authorities on the subject. Um, and so this is one of those cases where sometimes you'll hear a speaker, maybe you see a TED talk and somebody gets up on stage and they say, well, I'm a well-published author and I'm famous for X, Y, and Z, and here's my opinion on a topic. If we see someone up on a stage, if we see someone recognizable, we might automatically assume that they're an authority on the subject. The problem is, Different people have different um, qualities that would allow them to say someone's an authority. So sometimes they're an expert in the field. So if I wanted to look at an authority about biases in thinking, maybe I would go on the internet and I'd look up people who do lots of research addressing biases. And I could look at their vast collection of papers that they've published where they talk about biases and all of that information. And I would say, okay, they have a background. They seem to be an expert. I would call them an authority. The problem is not everyone bothers to do that kind of homework. Sometimes you can run into something like a public figure. So say a former president gets up on a news desk and starts talking about something they're passionate about. Some people might consider them an authority because they're a public figure, but in our case of critical thinking, maybe we want to evaluate whether being president is something that makes them an authority on the topic they're talking about. If what they're talking about is uh, public relations with other countries, then yeah, they might have experience um, having been a uh, person who dealt with other countries in the political stage. But if they're talking about uh, vaccines or something scientific, then the fact that they are someone um, recognizable and they're a public figure and they used to be president, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're an expert on another topic. Um, another thing that we have to watch for is that some people have significant personal experience. So you could listen to someone talk about, um, maybe they're going to talk about cancer and living through cancer because they themselves lived through cancer. Um, and 
In these cases, we have to think about it critically, kind of in the same way that we had to be cautious of using our own personal experiences, not because a personal experience is completely invalid, but because we have to consider it for what it is, which is a sample size of one. It's not giving us a large picture that we can apply to a larger population, it's just giving us one person's experience. So again, thinking critically about who's talking and what they're talking about. And so this brings us to um, sort of where are we getting the information that's controlling or influencing our beliefs? And so all of these colors at the top are things that we've just gone through. So talking about intuition or personal experience or um, information coming from an authority, these are all sources that have some flaws, things that we should consider um, when we're taking that information into consideration. That being said, we shouldn't also just blindly follow research. We're also going to have to critically evaluate where our research has come from, but it's usually going to be a better place to start. Um, and so we can start looking at sources of research and how we can start looking at that information. Our most important source of scientific information is almost always going to be journal articles or scientific journals. So if you ever have to do a uh, research paper or you have to go looking at um, sources of information, you're usually going to start looking at journals and articles published in those journals. And so if you're not familiar with a scientific journal, it's very similar to, say, a popular magazine where issues are put out maybe monthly or maybe quarterly or maybe annually, and within each journal, within each magazine equivalent, you get a couple of articles. The important part about these journals, the reason why they're such a great source of scientific information, is because these journals are what's called peer-reviewed. So a peer, a scientific research expert in that field, has to sit down and actually read over that article before it's published. So before a journal will accept a paper, they're going to consult with experts in the field and make sure that the paper that's being published is good science, that the research was well conducted, and that the conclusions that they've drawn are solid. And so within these journal articles, there are two major types. The first are called empirical journal articles. And these are going to be articles that are reporting the methods and results of usually one or maybe two research studies that are being reported specifically for the first time. So this is a researcher reporting uh, an experiment that they've just conducted and they've never reported the results before. The next kind of article are actually one of my favorites, and these are called review journal articles. And review articles are summaries of already published studies. So this is when somebody takes the time and goes through all of the other empirical studies that have been published in a particular field, and they collect them together into a review. So a review article it could be a narrative, it could walk you through the existing literature, it could even maybe do some um, additional statistics by combining the results of multiple other empirical studies to give us what's called a meta-analysis of the data. So it can give you a more complete picture than we could have ever gotten from a single empirical study. Um, so usually when you're new to a field, say you've joined a lab and you're going to be conducting research, you start looking for these review articles where they're going to tell you basically what all of the other smaller uh, single articles, those empirical articles, are telling you. So you get more information in one place in a nice, condensed, concise fashion. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I love review articles. Um, though they are, obviously, um, a lot harder to find because you need lots and lots of empirical articles in order to be able to write a review article.
Um, but that's besides the point. So other than our journal, journal articles, there are other ways that you can get access to scientific sources. Um, one of the other common ones in psychology is within chapters within edited books. So similar to a textbook um, or maybe a, uh, a book all about a particular topic or theme. Um, for example, I have helped write a chapter in a book all about communication um, in different species. So I've talked about songbird communication in a chapter in an edited book. Um, and these chapters are generally going to follow about the same format that you'd get in a scientific journal article because they're going to be peer reviewed. The editor of the book is usually an expert in this field and they can um, critically evaluate what you're saying in your chapter to make sure that what you're saying is backed up by science and that it's an actually good piece of writing on the topic. Um, a little bit rarer in psychology especially is to see something like a full-length book on a topic. Um, rarer but not unheard of. Um, so a full-length book in something like um, English or literature studies, you might have an entire book that describes one person's um, sort of career worth of research. So it could describe all of the research conducted by a person or a group of people. Um, so these do exist, they're just a little bit less common. Um, and all of these are going to be sources of getting science and you can be more confident in that by looking at the authors and figuring out that the authors are the researchers who conducted the research. So how do you actually find these scientific sources? And there's a bunch of different ways that you can go about this. Um, you can use PsychInfo, which is a database and search engine that's specifically geared towards articles in psychology. So this is maintained by the American Psychological Association, APA, um, and we'll talk quite a bit about them as we go through this course because they help sort of govern and regulate quite a bit to do with the field of psychology. Um, so that's a good place to start if you're looking specifically for psychological articles. Um, you can also go through Google Scholar. So not just regular Google, you have to hop over to Google Scholar and then it'll give you results specifically in scientific articles um, review and empirical articles and maybe even chapters in books or whole books. It'll give you links to all of those sources. Um, and then another great source is to go through the University of Alberta libraries. Um, most universities will maintain databases where you have access to a lot of different journals because unfortunately if you are not part of um, a university and already given access to some of these journals, it can get kind of expensive to get access into some of those. Um, so by going through the university, you can get past some of those paywalls that make it difficult to look at research. Um, and so for the next couple of slides, I just want to go over the very basics of how you go about reading research. So once you've got your hands on a journal article, how do you approach it? Um, and so the first part is going to be the abstract. And the abstract is kind of like the overall overview of the experiment. It's going to give you a little bit of background information from the introduction. It's going to give you a little bit about their methods and the statistics and the conclusions that they're drawing. So your abstract is summarizing the article. It's a great place to start if you are, say, doing a project where you have to figure out, is this an article that's related to my topic? Is this something that's worth looking at? Um, and the abstract is where you decide if you're going to invest the time to actually read the rest of the article. Our next section is the introduction, and this is where we get all of the background. So it's going to explain your topic of study, describe theoretical and empirical background for the research, and state specific research goals for the current study. Um, you could say that the introduction helps place the research that the paper you're looking at is going to be doing in the context of the field that it's being done for. 
So when I'm doing um, research and I'm writing something up talking about communication in songbirds, my introduction would talk about what we already know about communication in songbirds. Maybe give some examples of research that's similar to mine that mine might um, add more understanding to or that mine might relate to. Um, so your introduction is connecting your research to other similar research that people should know about to read your paper. For the methods, the methods are kind of the instruction booklet. It's telling you how the researchers conducted the study. So we're going to include the specifics on who the participants were, what materials they used, what procedure they followed, and any special equipment that they used in the process. So by reading through an experiment's methods section, you should know specifically how to run that experiment again if you wanted to try and, say, replicate that study. Or maybe you want to conduct a similar study, but on a different population. Maybe the study that you're looking at was doing research with um, uh, infants, maybe you want to run the same study, but this time with teenagers, or maybe you want to run it with dogs. Um, so the methods are going to give you the starting point to figure out how they set everything up so you can work from there. The results section is where they present the results. It's going to describe the statistical tests that they use. Uh, sometimes the statistical text or tests will be described in the methods. Uh, it depends, um, but they're definitely going to tell you the quantitative and qualitative results of the study. What did they find and what statistics did they use to get there? Um, and as we go through this course and talk more about statistics and evaluating statistics, we can talk about different measures that they'd report in the results and how that helps us be more certain in what they're talking about. And then at the end, you're going to have the discussion, sometimes called a conclusion. And this is where you summarize the study. So you're going to bring everything all together. You're going to discuss the study's significant contributions. So bring it back to the introduction where we were putting this study into the context of other research in the field. Um, and we're going to talk about sort of how does this study hold up to other studies? Maybe give us some alternative explanations for the results. Sometimes authors will be really good and they'll have a critical evaluation of their own methods. Maybe they got results, but they weren't the results they were expecting. And if we think back to that theory data cycle, maybe they'll talk about some of the revisions that they could make to either their procedure or to the theory that they were operating under. All of that gets talked about in the discussion. You discuss what you've taken from the experiment. Um, and then at the end is our reference section. So you're going to list all of the sources, all of the other research that you've talked about during your article. So this is how you can find links to other research in the field. Um, so if you're ever doing a paper and you need to find multiple sources, it's actually a good idea to start looking at which sources a paper has cited. It can lead you to other papers that have cited other papers that have cited other papers. And it leads you through sort of the whole field um, and gives you a feel for all of the other research that's been done. Um, it's not a uh, completely thorough way of getting everything in a field, but it's at least a good starting point. Um, so it's always a good idea to take a look at those references. So if you have to sit down and actually read an empirical journal article, one of the things that you want to do is look at it from um, sort of a step back. You don't really need to read every single word of the article. If you're just trying to figure out what somebody has concluded, maybe what evidence they're giving to support a theory, you don't necessarily need to know the specifics of the number of participants they used or where the study was conducted or something like that. Maybe you just need a very basic understanding of the article. Maybe you just need to know about their conclusions. So you can feel free to kind of pick and choose what you're reading 
depending on what you're using that information for. So you can start by looking at the argument. So what stance are they taking? What are they providing evidence for or evidence against? Um, you can read your abstract, get a feel for what's going on, and then maybe you're going to jump around a little bit. Maybe you don't need all of the background that's in the introduction, but maybe you want to read the last paragraph of the introduction where they start talking about this study and how it relates to other studies. Maybe you want to jump into the first paragraph of the discussion where they summarize all of their results and then start talking about it. You can usually skip over some of the methods and results sections unless you really need to know the details of how they conducted the study and what statistics they were using. Otherwise, you can kind of pick and choose what you're going to do. Um, and of course, there are other places other than, um, say, a university library or Google Scholar where you can find research. You can also find books on psychology in retail bookstores. I said that psychology specific entire books are rare, but they're not unheard of. Um, the one thing to keep in mind is that if you're finding them in a general bookstore, they're usually written in language for a general audience. So you have to know um, what the intent of the book is. So if it's not written with uh, lots of studies being referenced and lots of technical terms, um, then maybe you're getting a good summary and overview of a topic, but it wouldn't necessarily help you a whole lot if you were, say, writing a research paper on the topic. Um, the difference between, say, personal interest and professional interest. Um, another thing that's always good to talk about is Wikipedia. Um, and I find it interesting because when I was in school, Wikipedia was something that you were never, ever, never allowed to look at. We were told over and over again that it's a terrible thing and you should never look at a Wikipedia article to understand a topic. The interesting part is that Wikipedia has turned into a really good place to at least look at. It's not what you should use to write an entire assignment, but Wikipedia tends to be a good collection of multiple resources. So at the bottom of a Wikipedia article, they're going to list all of the citations, all of the references for the articles that are mentioned throughout the text. And so Wikipedia can give you a good starting point to find actual scientific articles. So it's not as evil as, as it's always uh, portrayed to be, but you should be cautious when using it because the information can be biased or not entirely correct. Um, so it's a good starting point sometimes, but make sure that you go and read the actual articles that it points you towards. Um, and then our last sort of less than scholarly place to find research is in the popular press, which we've kind of talked about a little bit. And we have to keep in mind that critical thinking, because if you're looking at something in a magazine or a blog post or something like that, the science has usually been adjusted or simplified to reach a general audience. Um, so it does exist and it can at least make you aware of certain topics, um, but just keep in mind who it's being written for and where their information's coming from. As always, critical thinking and evaluation of sources. Um, and on that note, that is the end of chapter two um, and we will leave it there.